Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author, and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy. But we're in this together, and we have some wonderful people helping us along the way. Now, there's no question there has been a marked increase in children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, and other neurological disorders. We have also heard of increases in food sensitivities, social problems, screen uses, medication use, and a decrease in getting out into nature, going out for recess, uh, unstructured play, an increase in stress. Are any of these things connected? Are we just making this all up? And if so, uh, what are we going to do about all of this? And if not, what are we going to do about all of this? To answer these questions and more, we are turning to Dr. Robert Melillo. Now, Dr. Robert Melillo is a world renowned chiropractic neurologist, professor, and researcher in child neurological disorders, and creator of the Brain Balance Program. Since 1994, his program has helped thousands of children with autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, and other disorders. His Brain Balance Achievement Centers are located throughout the United States. He's the author of Disconnected Kids, Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families, Reconnected Kids, and more. You can learn all about Dr. Melillo and his work at Dr. Robert Melillo. Melillo.com. I want to thank you so much for being here, Dr. Melillo, to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Oh, thank you, Robin. It's great. I really loved your intro there. Oh, well, I'm so appreciative. This is a really interesting topic. I have a lot of friends that are going to be listening in, many parents, many teachers across uh, the world that are going to be leaning into this interview because there really has been such an increase in diagnosis. But before we get to the meat of the matter. For those who haven't had the opportunity to meet you and read your books, can you tell us what gets you up in the morning and what got you so interested in helping children who've been diagnosed with autism, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, and other neurological disorders? Sure. Um, I've always had a clinical practice for the past 30 years, and my focus from the beginning was always on neurology and rehabilitation I had subspecialties in both areas, and I was very interested in academics and teaching and got into uh, teaching clinical neurology and brain research pretty early on. And I had developed a a really successful practice uh, over the first 10 years of my career, and uh, I had a beautiful wife, three small children. Uh, One evening, 1995, I walk into my house Nine o'clock at night, you know, after a long day of practicing, I'm tired. Um, and I see my wife sitting at the kitchen table with um, another woman that I don't know, and she's crying. Mm. So my wife introduces me and says, uh, this is Denise. Her son has severe ADHD and maybe mild autism. She's tried everything um, to really help her. She started this large organization of families and teachers here, and she had a fundraiser the other day, and I met her. And she was telling me, and, um, you know, she's tried everything in the traditional way, and she's looking to see if there's anything else that can help. Other people are talking to her about diet and nutrition and uh, eye uh, eye exercises and biofeedback and all different types of things, chiropractic, osteopathy. And I had had a practice where we had all of those specialties in in my practice, so I had for 10 years worked on one of the largest subspecialty practices uh, in the country. And so she said, and I know, told you, you know a lot about the brain. And so she asked if she could come and speak to you. Maybe you could help her. So I look at my wife and I smile and, you know, I'm polite. And then I grab her aside and I said, you know, I know what you're doing, but I don't have time for this. I'm not home. You know, this is, uh, this is really, you know, I don't, I really can't do this. I don't know what ADHD is. Mm -hmm. And she says, um, 
well, I think you can help her and she's in pain. She needs help. And I have a feeling that you're supposed to do something with this. Mm -hmm. So two days later, we go to our parent teacher meeting with my son and the teacher starts off by saying, uh, I think your son has ADHD. Mm -hmm. So now I hear those things. And first, of course, I feel like, you know, I feel like a professional, like a fraud, you know, I'm mm -hmm. supposed to be an expert. I don't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't even recognize it in my own child. Mm -hmm. So every other parent out there, I now feel like it's my fault mm -hmm. in some way. And I feel my wife's going to be mad at me. And I feel like, you know, everybody's going to look at me like, how did you, you know, what, what did you do to your son? Mm -hmm. Um, but through that, I also had this voice in my head that said, this isn't a coincidence that there's something happening here. And, so at that moment, I dedicated myself to first and foremost, really trying to help my son and Denise's son and any other child that I could. But I also knew at that point that there was a question that popped into my head is what is ADHD? What is actually happening in the brain? Um, and before I could develop any way or even know if there was a way to help any of these kids, I needed to know what it was. Mm -hmm. And that's really where it started for me. Mm. So interesting. And I can really relate to what you're saying about feeling like a fraud because as a child development specialist, anytime something's going on with my kids, I'm like, how did, how did this happen? How did I let this happen? It's easy to go right into that. And uh, of course, we have a lot of teachers listening in and I bet you they feel like that often as well and some parents as well. Now, you say in your book, Disconnected Kids, that when you first published Disconnected Kids, one out of 150 children were being di diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, and now the rate is one in 68, including one in 42 boys. In one study, you talk about a University of California study, I believe it was, that found an 800 percent increase in children diagnosed with autism in a 16-year span. You also mentioned that ADHD has skyrocketed 10 times more common today than a generation ago and is now considered the most common childhood health problem of any uh, mental issue. So what's going on here and why is there such a rise in these disorders? Well, that's what I loved about your intro because you really eloquently, the way you tied everything together, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's been really my research. It's, it's what does this all have to do with one another? Mm -hmm. First of all, is there a rise? And, and in my third book, Autism, a Scientific Truth, um, I really spent a lot of time researching it. And the first chapter is, are we actually facing an epidemic? Mm. Because, you know, that's somewhat controversial. There are people out there that say, oh, they've always been around. These kids have always been around that these numbers, we're just recognizing mm -hmm. more. And the difference between what we call prevalence versus incidence, meaning, you know, what the statistics say and then what the reality is, right? That's mm -hmm. incidence. So I, I really interviewed some of the top epidemiologists in this country when I was doing this. And for the most part, all of them said the same thing, that these, all of these issues in kids and now in adults is actually underreported in the literature. So it isn't that there's an overdiagnosis explosion or any of these things. And certainly there are things that has changed, um, things like we become more aware of them. We're better at diagnosing it. Um, there are, you know, changes in diagnostic criteria which have expanded you know, the diagnosis of autism in particular. So there are these things that have changed. But in all the studies put together, only about 45% of the rise from 1 in 10,000 30 years ago to 1 in 67, as you mentioned now, could be attributed to any of those factors, which means that 50%, almost 60% is completely unexplained. Mm -hmm. So can't be explained by any of that, which means that those are new cases that would not have existed 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. That qualifies this as an epidemic, as a huge epidemic. I mean, to give you some context, the rise in uh, polio, when one in 2,800 kids, it was uh, declared an epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking that, you know, with autism at one in, you know, 50 generally. But if you look at all of these issues together and you look at ADHD, ADHD affects one in nine kids mm. in the United States. And, um, it, you know, these all together, one in five kids in the United States have some mental diagnosis, and that doesn't include educational problems, things like dyslexia, processing, learning issues. Um, so just one in five. And 
what we see is one in five adults have that because when kids grow up with these issues, these developmental issues, they don't grow out of them on their own. They don't just go away. They end up being adults with these issues. So now we see that the fastest growing problem in adults is ADHD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just unbelievable what's going on and, you know, understanding that this is something that you don't grow out of. And now we've got all these adults who are dealing with this issue right now, maybe haven't gotten the skills or the treatment that is needed, whatever you think is, is appropriate. So I know that a lot of your work focuses on functional disconnection and the fact mm -hmm. that disconnected kids are different because they feel different. I just would love for you to explain what functional disconnection is and what the kids have in common. What do you really mean by the fact that they feel different and that's why they are different? Yeah. Well, this is, you know, again, goes back to the core root issue, which I think is, is the basis of all of my work over the past 20, 25 years, which is what is actually happening in the brain, not just in ADHD, because what you realize is when you, st when I started looking at ADHD, there was this thing called comorbidity, which means that all of these kids have multiple diagnoses at the same time. You know, you never see a kid with ADHD that doesn't have some form of OCD or Tourette's or a kid with autism that has ADHD or dyslexia, has a learning disability, has, you know, attention problems. So, you know, real quickly, I realized that these weren't separate issues. Mm. They were actually the same problem manifesting differently because they're affecting different areas and different networks in the brain. And in particular, they affect more right side or left hemisphere issues. So, you know, it came down to what is actually happening. And even now, like I just got back from Bulgaria, as I told you last night, I lectured two days ago to 100, 150 of some of the top physicians and therapists in the country. First question I always ask anybody is, you know, who can tell me what it is? And the answer is always the same. Nobody can. Um, so even now, most people don't know the answer to this. But this has been my core research. Um, I head up a research lab. We've published hundreds of papers on this. And the bottom line is everybody for the last kind of 15 years or so, maybe since the late 90s, has known that these problems are about what's called functional connectivity in the brain meaning that there isn't any damage or injury. It's not a chemical problem. It's not inflammation. It's not pathology. It's not genetic mutations because in the vast majority of all of these issues, even most mental health issues, they have no actual genetic mutation in the vast majority of, of the people that have these issues. So therefore, what is it? It's almost this invisible issue, and that's why people don't really know. Even professionals don't really know what the problem is. And so what we know is that it really is about the way the brain communicates. It's the way the brain functions and connects and synchronizes um, with one another and how networks speak to one another, especially on on different sides of the brain. And when there is a problem that interferes with that, certain networks resonate better than others. And it's all about resonance. I would, at a conference I spoke at this summer um, at Harvard Medical School on uh, movement and cognition. And one of the leading speakers was great. I was the keynote, but another guy, he said, you know, all conscious uh, states or resonant states, meaning that it's all about how different networks and different areas of the brain resonate with one another. And there's these timing mechanisms in the brain. And when that is off, when that's thrown off, it throws off the way we think. It throws off the way we organize our thoughts and put together memories and therefore affects how we're able to learn, whether it's socially, behaviorally, or whether it's academically. All of them are learning. They're just different networks in different areas of the brain. And this is what the concept of functional disconnection is all about. Mm, okay. So if they are disconnected, um, that, that the brain is sort of not communicating correctly or on time with one another, that things are not firing as predictably as perhaps in a typically developing brain, then there may be some issues here that we see outward, which would come out in social, um, emotional, and academic, and perhaps even physical ways, violent ways, um, because those children aren't able to take in information and deal with information in the same way. 
Exactly. So what happens is as the brain is developing and the two sides of the brain develop in series, not in parallel with one another, which means that the right side of the brain is predominantly developing in, in the in the first two to three years. And then we switch to left brain development. And by that, I mean both sides of the brain are growing. Both sides of the brain are growing, but the right side or the left side is just about 20, 30 percent more active during a, a phase of growth. So it means that anything that's coming in and the brain is built from the outside in and from the bottom up and then it build and then the brain grows and then it comes from the top down and regulates everything, mm -hmm. everything in our body, our immune system, our digestive system, autonomic system, heart rate, everything, hormones is regulated by the brain. And for it to function appropriately, the brain has to be regulating it appropriately. So if the if what's happening is if something interferes with that development from the bottom up, like building a building from the bottom, from the foundation to the top, if something slows it down, what happens is one side of the brain, so let's say if it happens in the womb or early in the first couple of years, the right brain may slow down in its development. It's not as active as it should be. And then the left brain may kick in too early. So what we see is we see certain areas of the brain become hyperactive mm -hmm. on one side where other areas of the brain are underdeveloped or immature. Mm -hmm. And we see this unevenness of skills that's characteristic of all of these issues. Mm -hmm. So even if we look at the name ADHD, right, what we're describing is an attention problem, which is a right brain function. So the right brain attention network, what's called the dorsal attention network, is underdeveloped. And then what we see is hyperactivity, impulsivity, increased motor activity, obsessive compulsive behavior is a left brain function. And we see hyperactivity or overactivity that produces hyperactivity or impulsivity. And that's the, that's the H part, right? So the HD is too much activity in the left brain along with underactivity in the right. And t we combine those things together and that produces this issue we call ADHD. And that's true with every single issue out there. We have some symptoms that are because we have too much, typically on one side of the brain. And then we have other symptoms that are because we have underdevelopment on the other side of the brain. So there's this developmental imbalance or what's called a developmental asynchrony where one side of the brain or certain networks are growing and maturing at a different rate. And that's ultimately what produces all of these issues. I mean, it's so interesting the way that you're explaining it. It makes so much sense. I'm wondering if this issue is, is, is the reason why people typically say that kids who have been diagnosed with some of these types of disorders seem more immature in the social arena or, or academically, um, but perhaps gifted um, or ahead of the game in other areas. Exactly. That's This is one of the first things I, I saw, Robin, when I first started reading about what the heck is ADHD. The first thing I read about was this unevenness of skills. They said, you know, these kids are not bad at everything. In fact, they're very intelligent or even exceptional right. in certain areas. So right from the beginning, you know, I had a rehab mentality and you know that in rehab, it's all about establishing balance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so from the beginning, I said, wow, that sounds like some sort of imbalance. And, you know, as I researched it, I saw that all the things that they did really good were left brain skills and all the things that they really struggled were right brain skills. And that's kind of what clued me in that, wow, could this actually be the issue and how could this happen? And then when I learned that the right and left brain develop at different stages and I realized this was all just a developmental issue. And recently out of the University of Michigan Medical School, there was a study in 2016 where they found a way to map the growth and maturity of networks in the brain. And what they did is they looked at typical kids and ADHD kids, and they found that, you know, in over 500 kids, they mapped the, their brain, and they found that kids with ADHD have underdeveloped or immature networks in their brain. And that's what we see. But it's not only underdeveloped, it's actually there because of the, because one side slows down, what happens is the other side tends to speed up. Mm -hmm. So we end up getting this, 
this over maturity where we have, you know, kids and we see it all the time. And we at Brain Balance, we've worked with almost 40,000 kids mm-hmm. in the United States and we've tested them all with the most, you know, stringent objective measurements in everything, including academic achievement. And we see kids that come in and it's remarkable. Some of these kids are four, five, six, seven, eight years ahead mm-hmm. in certain skills, but yet they can be four or five or six years mm-hmm. behind in other skills. And that imbalance there, that functional imbalance is actually the problem. Mm-hmm. That is the actual disability that we see because that maturity imbalance prevents those networks from being able to resonate with one another and combine the information so that the child can use their whole brain at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, I love what you're saying. I think it's just unbelievably interesting. So, so how can a parent or a teacher identify if a child has a functional disconnection issue? Is there some kind of test? Is there, are there symptoms? Are there signs we should be looking for? Yeah. Well, you know, what drives brain development, and this is another issue that, you know, I came across early on when I was looking at this, and it having a rehab physical background, um, I remember I spoke to a teacher once in the very beginning, and I said, is this is this rise in ADHD real, or is it just, you know, fake? Mm-hmm. And this was in 1995, and she said, oh, my God, you have no idea how real it is. Mm-hmm. The 50% of the kids in her elementary school lined up for the pill mm-hmm. at lunchtime. Mm-hmm. And I went, wow. And I said, why? And she said, I don't know. It has something to do, I think, with that kids don't use their big muscles anymore. She said, you know, I see them on the playground. They just sit there. She's like, they, you drive around any neighborhood. They're not in the street. Right. They're not climbing trees. And at the same time, I see that they're different in the classroom. And she said, maybe you can figure that out. And I, and bam, it hit me. And I went, you know what? I think I can figure that out because this is my area, right? Mm-hmm. This is the area I really know. So it turns out that movement is what develops the brain. It's really the key thing, especially in the first six years, to form the foundation of this right and left brain and the coordination and the timing that we build up in our body to allow us to stand up and walk and run and do it in a coordinated way is actually the same timing mechanism that we use to coordinate networks on either side of the brain. So what we also see in all of these kids is that they all have problems with gait and they're clumsy and they're awkward and almost all of them have some sort of motor milestone delay where they don't roll over or they don't crawl in the right way or they don't crawl at all or they they crawl too long or they they uh, drag their leg or they scoot on their butt and then they walk late. And almost every kid that I work with, especially autistic kids, they have this history. So that's one of the first things that I tell parents. Those motor milestones matter. And pediatricians, unfortunately, often say that to tell them it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, they also give too long of a window. Like they say up to 16 or 17 months, if the child's not walking, that's normal. In my mind, if they're not walking by 14 months, in all the kids I've seen, they're Mm -hmm. late. And if they're late in walking, they're going to be late in talking. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of movement and cognition, like I said this summer, at Harvard Medical School, and this was the second one we had at Oxford last year, the whole basis of this is some of the researchers in the world looking at movement and cognition and the relationship of those two. So, you know, understanding that children, if they're not moving, it's going to affect their brain, and and the most common reason why they don't move properly is because they have something called retained primitive reflexes. So this is the first thing I tell parents to look at. Okay, so what is this retained primitive? Reflexes, reflexes, the primitive reflexes, when we're born, like I said, we don't really have a brain yet. Um, we don't really have a motor cortex yet. It's very, so we, we have to move to survive, to feed ourselves, to <clears throat> interact and engage our senses so we can build the brain. So we're born with these reflexes called primitive reflexes. We're all familiar with them, things like rooting and sucking reflexes mm-hmm. so a baby can latch on or grasping reflexes or orienting reflexes or things called like the Moreau or this, uh, mm-hmm. the, uh, the asymmetric tonic neck reflex. And these are re- reflexes that are there when the baby is born and they should go away. Most of them go away within the first six months, but the last one goes away at one year and they go away and then they allow for the brain stem to mature and they allow for more complex, what we call postural reflexes that allow us to stand up and walk 
and that all builds the brain. And then literally out of the motor cortex in the brain grows the prefrontal cortex where all of our cognitive abilities are, and then the brain comes down and regulates everything. So what we see is that kids, if they don't get rid of these primitive reflexes when they're supposed to, they act as a form of arrested development on areas of the brain and delay and slow down growth, and they will stay with them forever. I mean, they never go away. And when we get rid of these primitive reflexes, it basically unlocks the, the, the brain so that it can actually catch up to where it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so this is one of the first stages that we do. Hmm. Okay. So I, I'd love to get into a little bit more about how we can develop this balance that we need. I know in your book you talk about many environmental factors that can put a child at greater risk for functional disconnection from brain imbalances of the birth parents to parental diet to vitamin D deficiencies, uh, stress, weight, history of psychiatric illness, fetal exposure to medications. So, I mean, if parents feel that their children do indeed have this disconnected disconnection issue, what can they do specifically to help their child? I mean, can the brain change in these sort of positive ways? And if so, what are some tips that, that you can give us now? Yes, absolutely. That's the good news is that because there is no genetic mutation, as many people um, uh, assume and they're not, and there's no actual damage, mm. <clears throat> there's, in most cases there's nothing preventing us from correcting these mm. issues mm-hmm. on a long-term basis. And again, working with tens of thousands of kids, you know, we have a very high success rate in our centers. And now, you know, I really focus a lot of my time working on severe uh, children with autism. And, and, you know, I'm getting the majority of them to start to speak wow. in a relatively short period of time. So um, the idea is that, yes, because what we need to do is we focus on the underdeveloped areas of the brain, on the underdeveloped and air- networks, and we do a combination of, ser- of exercises and stimulation. Since environmental factors are what cause these, modifying or manipulating our environment is what changes them back. And that means also diet and nutrition, physical activity level. Um, but we do targeted stimulation. So as we said, first of all, we get rid of these primitive reflexes if they're there. Um, that releases a lot of the, the things that are holding it back. And then we, you know, encourage physical activities, core. This, this allows the child to start building these normal networks where they feel their body and they get connected to their body and their environment. They engage their senses and they start to then build up the, the stimulation and we and we then also use things like light and sound and music and vestibular in ear stimulation or touch um, and uh, rhythmic movement and things of this nature to target it towards one side of the brain the underdeveloped side of the brain and in doing that in measurable ways we can measure and we actually see the maturity of those networks increase as we measure them objectively meaning that we measure them and so let's say a child is doing something either physically or cognitively at a five-year-old level, but yet they're 10 years of age. We do activities and stimulate them to grow it to a six-year-old and then a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old, and we measure them until they get up to where they're doing it at a 10-year-old level or even beyond. So now that the brain is now balanced and now this promotes integration and communication and connectivity, and this effectively corrects the problem. Mm-hmm. And all of this is described in my book, Disconnected Kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, really interesting book. And I, I believe you're right that it's very much, it's very helpful to gain this knowledge and understand some of these different ways of getting at the balance that we need. Now, if a child, and I want to challenge you here a little bit so that um, we can hear your wording. If a child needs a lot of dietary changes, environmental changes, they're used to a certain diet. They're used to, you know, a lot of video games and not getting outside or not playing sports. How can we speak to them about these changes? Like, so if you can imagine the child is sitting in front of you right now, what could a parent say to get them on board with these, with these changes that may be very all-encompassing for them? Yeah, and this is one of my biggest challenges right now, Robin. I'm sure you find it as well. Is that you know, ideally, <laughs> ideally, it's I would like for parents 
you know, not to expose their kids to the video games and to the iPhone when they're two years of age. And, and it's an automatic thing now. Parents, as soon as there's like dead air, mm-hmm. if it's, you know, bored, boredom or they're doing something, the immediate thing they do is they stick the phone in the child's hand. Um, and it's, it's literally like using a drug mm-hmm. to sedate them. And uh, it's so ubiquitous that nobody thinks twice about it and nobody's out there really saying, well, you shouldn't do that. So what happens is that very quickly our society has changed. Um, and the use of technology and computers and video games, especially in the first six years when the two hemispheres are just forming, literally can, can create an imbalance in the brain because most of the digital technology stimulates the left brain mm. much more and it can bring it online too early mm. or make it too strong. Um, and this can, you know, lead to overdevelopment of those areas and underdeveloped so that we see so much in the area of right brain deficient problems like ADHD and, and autism and OCD and Tourette's and even schizophrenia, psychosis, drug addiction. Those are all right brain delays that we see in our society. And so the first thing I really do, and if I'm speaking to the child, it's hard because if they've already become, it's like talking to a drug addict, right? Mm-hmm. I tell parents like this. It's like, yeah, you know, if I'm talking to someone who's a drug addict, they're not going to listen to me, right? Mm-hmm. It's very hard for them. I mean, they may understand that they're struggling or in pain, but especially when a child, this is all they've known since they were two years old or three years old. They don't even remember not doing it. Mm-hmm. So they've only, they only know a certain way. Um, you know, my wife and I have a web series TV show that we do called Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families, where we go into the homes and actually work with families with severe issues as they're going through one of our brain balance centers. And so you can see our approach and, um, and we go in there and, and these kids are, you know, in rages and angry and it, it, the house is just torn apart and it's a mess and the relationship is on the brink of disaster and, you know, the diet and nutrition, and it's a a depressed household. Mm -hmm. And we have to turn it around, but we're able to do it in a short period of time. And the bottom line, it comes down to this, is that kids want their parents. They want parents they're going to respect. Mm -hmm. They want structure. They actually like it. It makes them feel safer. Mm -hmm. A lot of the rages and anxiety is because they're basically saying, there's no parent at home here. Like they know Mm -hmm that they should be regulated. They know they shouldn't sit there for eight hours in a row playing video games and eating candy or junk food, but nobody's telling them any different. So what I found is that when you do start to establish structure, and especially one simple thing, is that when the child does something, you know, it's setting up rules, writing rules, literally sitting there with the child Mm -hmm. and saying, Let's set up rules. I'm sure you talk about this all the time. And then, (laughs) and then there has to be consequences. Mm -hmm. And if there are no consequences, and usually if you ask the child what the consequence shall be, they'll actually tell you that, right? Um, and then you just play by those rules. And kids understand that. They understand when they play a game that if you don't have rules, the game isn't fun. Right. So I, I think those are some of the most basic things. And that's what I wrote my second book, Reconnected Kids, was all about as well. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. I do talk about this a lot. And in fact, I have printables so that the parents can work with their kids on exactly what you're talking about, that they need to talk about their their top rules or they can call them agreements or um, you know, however they want to structure that, but also talking about the reason for those rules and what their rights are when they follow them and also what the consequences are, not just in terms of what happens to them, but just what happens to the whole family when things right. are not followed. Like what, what happens here? The stress level goes up, you know, people are angry. What happens when that, you know, when we're not following these rules or expectations or agreements? So I am right there with you because it, when the kids have structure, they, they feel so much better and they know how to be successful. So I agree with that. Can you give us as parents or educators 
um, just give us an example of something we can do at home, like a specific cognitive or social exercise that we might be able to do with our kids, maybe in like the elementary school range, so maybe not quite as young, um, aside from getting them out and getting them to move their muscles. But what, what is a specific thing we might be able to do with them today uh, after hearing this, this interview? Yeah, you know, just obviously increasing physical activity in general and, and diet is important. But in most kids that have more, let's say, right brain delays and even kids with left brain delays, what we know is really engaging the big muscles mm -hmm. and causing what we call heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. um, it actually changes their brain more rapidly than anything else. Building and increasing muscle tone mm -hmm. um, and increasing our aerobic capacity and how we, our heart rate, you know, the idea of our digestive issues and leaky gut and food sensitivities and all of these that you mentioned in your intro is all related to one another because when the brain is out of balance, all of those systems can get out of balance and an overactive immune system leads to food sensitivities. You can't have food sensitivities if you don't have proper production of digestive enzymes and if you can't break down the food to begin with. Mm. So why does that happen? And it happens because the fight or flight system is very high and the parasympathetic or rest and digest system isn't developing because the brain isn't developing. So we see that something called heart rate variability, getting the heart to go up and down and up and down. Just, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at how kids typically play, right? When you were growing up, you play tag or something. Yeah, you right. run around, you run around with your friends and then you die, right? And right. then you, you're on the... <laughs> And then you're breathing heavy. And then you get up and you do it again. And it's fun. Yes. And you never see anybody do that. Like mm -hmm. nobody varies their heart rate. Parents, everybody. So believe it or not with the parents, like going out and playing something like tag with your kids, mm -hmm. running around, um, you know, running after them and going out and, and riding bikes and going outside and do something that really is going to get your heart rate moving and doing things that are going to strengthen your muscles. I mean, simple thing like having a pull-up bar in the house mm. and having your kids at young ages, you know, hang from the bar or do pull-ups or uh, do things like that, believe it or not, that idea of brachiation. These types of activities are really important and it's important to incorporate this early on with your kids. You sit, do push-ups, do sit-ups, um, you know, do those things and then vary your heart rate up and down. Those things alone, first of all, get you away from a computer and a video game. Mm -hmm. And it's fun for the kids because they like that. It gets them to socially engage others, which they're not doing at this point. And it gets them to build that heart rate variability, which is going to help balance out that fight or flight system and calm it down so that the digestive system will work and their immune system will work better. Oh, so helpful. I really love that. And it's something that we can all do. And I, I'm sure that you've looked into uh, the school systems and hoping that they'll incorporate more physical activity. I know that that's been an issue nationally uh, where, you know, we're taking more recess away, where we're not engaging them in as much gym uh, and physical education. And, and we need to incorporate it across the board, not just within families, but hopefully also in the schools. Because the more that we provide recess and an, a physical outlet for kids, the better they're able to think and perform in school and also just learn and be happy in general yeah I just filmed I was just out in LA and I filmed a documentary movie that I think is supposed to be scheduled to be out next year um, with, a, with a young director named Aaron Wolf and Aaron grew up with disabilities and dyslexia and so he's very passionate about it and the movie is going to be called I am not disabled mm. uh, and he plans on literally having it in movie theaters and the idea behind this is everything that you're saying, what we have to do with our educational systems to, uh, you know, protect kids from being bullied and to also understand that these things that I'm talking about, like my research on the brain and exercise and all of this stuff, and, and we have to incorporate more brain science, brain research, and understand how the brain works and develops and incorporate that into our educational systems, which sounds almost 
crazy, right? That, you know, we, we all kind of know instinctively that learning is about the brain. But most of what we do in the educational system doesn't consider anything about the brain. Mm-hmm. So there's a movement I call that we're, we're trying to push called neuroeducation, mm-hmm. which means everything we do should be focused on what's going to be best for the brain and the developing brain at different stages mm-hmm. because the brain is different at different stages and learns differently at different mm-hmm. stages. But it's also not about just trying to compensate for these issues anymore because we can't handle that. You know, our schools are overwhelmed. Special ed programs are overwhelmed. We really have to recognize that we have to address the core issue and try to actually correct these problems so that we that's the only good long-term management strategy, actually. Mm-hmm. All right. Give us your top tip out of everything we've talked about or perhaps we haven't yet today. Uh, what would you say would be your top tip to help kids who have some of these neurological issues that we've discussed? You know, I got to say, if there's one thing, if there's one thing, and I've said it, so it's a little redundant, but if there's one thing that parents can do uh, to prevent these issues and to really help uh, change them and improve them is movement. I mean, there is no, the, the, the understanding of that. Is, first of all, it's all about the brain and understand that, you know, everything and mental health, physical health, emotional health, education, it's all about the brain. And movement is the main thing that drives brain activity and development. And it keeps it that way through the course of our life. You know, the two areas that I'm really focusing on uh, because Brain Balance has done a great job. We have a hundred some odd centers around the country and it's focused on really helping kids, but more, you know, kids that are in the higher functioning range. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been focusing really around the world on the really low functioning kids, the kids with severe nonverbal autism. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the questions I get and which is really more of a problem now is what about adults? Like what mm-hmm. happens to these kids when they grow up mm-hmm. if they're not And the fact is, and the kid with ADHD becomes an adult with ADHD. So my focus right now individually for me is really looking at adults and looking at kids and developing a program called the Melillo Method to really address those issues because, you know, it it really, but all of it really starts with movement because even in adults, a lot of our health and mental health issues is because we're sitting in front of our computers. We're not moving Mm -hmm. We're, we're eating really bad foods mm-hmm. and, and, you know, so if there's one tip, it's move. It's the one, one thing. Move, increase your strength somehow, some way, especially your big muscles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that will have a big impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, give us the resource of the week. Where can everybody go to get more information about you, your programs, your books and everything you have to offer? Yeah, DrRobertMelillo.com is my website, and actually we've been working on it so that um, at the end of this upcoming month, we should be um, coming out with a whole new kind of branded look on it because uh, we want to really expand the reach of the awareness mm-hmm. of people of this. But um, also, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram on, uh, at DrRobMelillo. Mm-hmm. So Instagram... Um, my web page, um, and then we have this web series on YouTube for my wife, which is Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families, that they can actually see us mm-hmm. and see what happens in a brain balance center um, and see us, you know, really work with these families and see the changes that are possible. It's really quite remarkable. It sounds remarkable. And I, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Melillo, for your insights and your strategies. I, I loved what you said about movement and how the brain can change in such positive ways. I feel like you give such hope uh, to many families and to uh, education so that we know that getting a diagnosis doesn't mean that you know, it's downhill from here that there is so much that we can do to help bolster our children's brain balance and really help them to thrive. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, it's my pleasure, Robin, because getting this out there is important. And I think, you know, to that, one of the things I tell parents is that the kids that develop these imbalances are usually actually the most gifted kids out there. They actually have areas of their brain that are naturally stronger Mm -hmm. um, than most kids, and that makes them more susceptible for this imbalance if these other networks don't keep pace. So therefore, you know, it's something that, 
you know, they, it's not only hope. These kids are really very, very gifted. And recently, I've been engaged by a company called Vine Pesi, P-E-S-I, um, to actually put together a course, an intro course, that is for mental health professionals and behavioral and rehab professionals around this country. And um, if they want to find out how to attend that and they can get continuing education credits and really give them some basic tools mm -hmm. to work with, if they go to PESI, P-E-S-I, mm -hmm. um, and look at I think I'm going to be in Chicago um, doing this for three days. And, um, you know, that's where they can actually learn some of these techniques and really get this out there for people. Excellent. I'm sure that is useful to all of those mental health professionals who would be interested in, in moving forward in this area. It's such a, an important area. We need it. We need people to know more about it so that they can help our kids. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends. I know you have yours, so let's discuss them. Let's talk about all of this great information we've gotten from Dr. Melillo. Come up on Facebook. Go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page. I'm going to be connecting to Dr. Melillo's page. And let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com, twitter.com slash drrobin. Again, I'm going to be going back and forth with Dr. Melillo and his office. Um, we are also on Instagram. I'll be developing memes so that we can go back and forth. And I'll be developing these memes so that we have quotes that can go out. And you can post them up and talk about all the great things that you've been talking about we've been talking about today. And if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it so other people can learn about Dr. Melillo's methods, how he thinks, how he's been helping people, and how they can use them in their own homes. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today, my fellow parents, leaders, and educators. Thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. There's great podcasts up there, and the show notes for this podcast will be up there as well. As always, I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, You've got this. I know you've been hearing all this information today, and you're probably thinking, oh, I messed up here, I messed up there. Don't do that. Remember, we can always move forward. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. I see you. I'm right there with you. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you're 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.